Um, I'd like to start off, if that's okay, Please. with a question of my own, and then we can um, we can ra a raise of hands of who would like to ask a question, and we'll pick at random. So my question is: um, You were talking about uh, all the pluses about technology and the yeah. positive things and the amazing things that are going to happen. Yeah. Um, a worry of mine, and more than mine, my mother's, because she's always telling us to get off our phones and yeah. talk to each other, yeah. is that traditional means of communication, language, sure. eye contact, yeah. human yeah. humanity, yeah. what's going to happen to that when yeah. all of a sudden we can sort of communicate by just chips? Yeah that sure. are sending signals to one another. Sure, that's, I mean, that's a legitimate concern, you know, that everybody being on their smartphone at the expense of maybe more meaningful face-to-face -face interaction. I mean, look, there's no doubt that face-to-face -face interaction is a more high-fidelity form of mediation between minds because it's full sensory. You can feel the person. You can see the verbal cues. You can smell the person. I mean, their arms, their body language. It's, it's more high-resolution interface, no doubt. The problem is it requires the person to physically be there, right? And before information technologies, you were limited to whoever happened to be around. Now, if, if you were lucky, all the people that were around were really stimulating to you and really inspiring to you and really nourishing to your spirit, but not everybody's so lucky, right? And so I think some of the conveniences of wireless information technologies is that they free us from the limitations of time and space. They collapse geography. The cyborg anthropologist Amber Case calls a FaceTime conversation a techno-social wormhole. Literally, like a fold in space and time <laughs> so two minds can interface across oceans and continents. Now, that's a convenient. The minus part is that it comes at a cost of resolution because it's either text or just voice or maybe if you're lucky, FaceTime. But, okay, it's a trade-off. And I'm not saying one should substitute the other. I think it's a matter of balance. And I think if you can have in-person in conversations that are meaningful regularly, you should. But I also think it shouldn't, you shouldn't turn away the opportunity to connect with somebody across the world that shares a similar obscure passion that you have. And that we shouldn't dismiss the conveniences of collapsing geography. Now, taking a step further, I think virtual reality or augmented reality will, the full blossoming of that will finally free us of the trade-off between fidelity and geography. Because when we have fully immersive virtual reality, like indistinguishable from Which this. Which is very soon, I think. I mean, I think we're seeing the, the beginnings of it. But again, remember exponentials, okay? Eventually, I could be in Tokyo, you could be in Amman or London, and we could all meet in a physical environment that looks like the most gorgeous beach in the world, if we want to. <laughs> like, we will be able to have high resolution, fully embodied cognitive exchanges that mimic or even improve upon in-person reality. We will have that opportunity. And of course, some people will say, oh, it's not natural. But what you have to remember is that even face-to-face -face interaction is still an accident of perception. It's still limited by the way the brain processes information. You're still coloring reality by culture, by language informs reality, context informs reality, the clothing we wear informs reality. When people put on a uniform, they treat the world differently and they interpret events in the world differently. So the idea of an unmediated natural encounter with people is a myth because all encounters are mediated by context, by setting, by culture. All these things already color your world. We talked about that on Brain Games. So whether you're having in-person or virtual or eventually deeply immersive virtual reality, my hope is that it will lead to deeper intersubjective exchanges, a deeper opportunity to know the insides of each other's minds. Now, to take it to the next level, Terence McKenna, the philosopher, says that full virtual reality will increase intimacy between human beings in ways we cannot even imagine. Because today, if I want to open up to you, I write you a love letter or I invite you to my room, right? It's really intimate. My posters are on the wall, my books, my memories, my photos. But my room is still rudimentary compared to what's in here, right? Full virtual reality might allow, actually allow and to invite you into the universe inside my head, the universe inside my mind. And imagine what kind of dreamscapes will be possible for mind to mind to soul to soul union when we can visit each other's minds. And this will happen. If we can conceive it, we can achieve it. So imagine that. Okay. Good answer.